Well, good afternoon again, everybody. Um, so happy to see you. Hope everyone's staying strong and safe. And as we say on Good Morning Revolution, we hope everybody's staying in the fight because we need you. You know, it's election time and in a few weeks, voters are gonna decide who controls the Congress. Those who outlawed abortion and block voting rights or will the forces of democracy win a working majority? Simply put, that's what's at stake, y'all. I mean, we're talking about um, child tax credit. Um, we're talking about uh, climate change and whether or not the PRO Act is gonna have a serious chance of getting passed. And I ain't got to tell you today that passing that PRO Act is really important because our working class is on the move. Just a few days ago, 15,000 workers, nurses in Minneapolis and Duluth took to the picket lines. They say, I don't know if it's true or not, that that was the largest uh, private hospital strike in our history. And in the last weeks, 115,000 railway workers threatened to shut down shipping. And what was the big issue? Check this out. Having a day off of sick leave. Can you imagine? Those greedy so-and-sos didn't want to give up a work day for being sick. And this in an industry, and I ain't making this up, where one CEO had a 920% wage increase, pay increase. And they have the nerve, the audacity to complain that workers demanded 25%. Keep on train industry. Keep on with that kind of uh, disparity, wage, that kind of greed. That's the kind of stuff revolutions are made of. And I'll tell you something else. The threat of that strike scared the hell out of the ruling class. It did. And that's why uh, forces in Congress and the administration work so hard to settle. Let's see if the workers accept it. Yeah, our working class today is on the move, y'all. Did you know that in July, there were, uh, what was it, uh, 56 strikes across the country with some 8,000 workers on the picket line. 39 of those strikes started after July the 1st. And get this, work stoppages at Starbucks accounted for the largest number. I'm telling you, the Starbucks and Amazon organizing efforts have, 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 have energized the labor movement and beyond in unprecedented ways. Congratulations, y'all. And a special congratulations to our comrades who have joined the effort. You are doing us proud and we love you for it. Last summer, and I can't believe I'm already saying summer because it already feels like fall. But last summer, the AFL-CIO had its convention and the new leadership team there has the challenge now of addressing this growing organizing and unrest. And I want to say today that we wish them every success because their success will be our success. Same holds true for the Labor Notes Conference. The size uh, uh, and energy displayed there on that June 18th weekend reflected uh, uh, this growth and, and, and also in the challenge of addressing the newly emerging broad uh, militant uh, working class left. In fact, all of us have this challenge. And in this respect, I'm happy to tell you that there's something new taking place in our party. 
in many places, it is being built in and through these efforts is true. And that's very different, for example, than when I came of age in the party and more like what I imagined what happened during the organization of the CIO. To address it, we had a salting class at the Little Red Schoolhouse, uh, which was very uh, enthusiastically received and, and we planned to take those classes on the road. Salting school from the people who brought you the CIO. And it's really important to address it, comrades, because we've got to respond to the political moment. Strike the iron while it's hot, because the crisis of everyday living continues to deepen. And people are fed up. Inflation is out of control. Now I know there's some relief at the gas pump, uh, gas pump now. Well, who knows what the price is going to be in November, because ain't nothing certain. In this world under capitalism, except death and taxes and the corporate drive for maximum profits. Now, if you take that cost of living and you add resentment at corporate profiteering and you mix in a dash of raw racism and you got an explosive situation and that's what we're dealing with today. Am I lying? complete with threats of political violence and civil war. And that coup that they attempted in January, uh, on January the 6th, two years ago, it ain't over. No, in state after state, they're trying to suppress the vote if they can, change it if they're able, and disregard it if the first two options ain't available. That's right, I said it. The majority faction in the Republican Party has decided that they cannot, will not lose an election. And, and, and they're willing to do anything to prevent it, including taking up arms. And they're telling it from the mountaintop into the valleys from sea to a goddamn shining sea. And this is all part and parcel of Trump's blitzkrieg strategy that's taken straight out of a Nazi playbook. Constantly attack, never relent, never apologize, put the pedal to the metal and it's full speed ahead at all costs. Now, I ask you a question. What do you do with a cat like that, supported by a billionaire class with a mass movement at his back? I'll tell you what, you stop him dead in his tracks. The Justice Department's apparent decision to move forward with laying the basis for charges, you gotta see it within that context. Not to do so would be an invitation to catastrophe. But as the January 6th hearings revealed, the problem is a whole lot bigger than one person. It is. It's that magma movement as a whole, y'all. And here I got to say Joe Biden was right when he named it semi-fascist. In fact, ain't no semi about it. And it's about goddamn time if somebody called it like it is, you know, somebody in authority. Now, maybe others, not so brave, will feel like they got permission to say it, including at the hearings. And that's important because you see, these hearings have had a big impact on the lead up to the elections, they have. But they ain't the only thing that had an impact. And uh, the Supreme Court and the Dobbs decision, talk about shifting the public debate. Oh my goodness. And state after state, women and men 
but mostly women in huge numbers started registering to vote. Then came the election in Kansas and all hell broke loose when a referendum to remove abortion rights fell from the state constitution, fell by 18 points. Several elections since then have moved the same way. People, uh, thankfully, are starting to wake up to the fact that democracy itself is on the ballot. And comrades, this struggle for democracy is so important. I mean, think for a moment about what happened the day after Trump's inauguration and the million strong women's demonstrations that rocked the country. And remember the, 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 the mass occupations at the airports after Trump's Muslim ban? And then came uh, the tragedies of Breonna Taylor's murder and George Floyd's murder and, 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 and the Black Lives Matter uprisings. And that really helped lay the basis for Trump's defeat. It's true. Folks marched from the ballot box, rather from the street to the ballot box. Now, all of these protests had one thing in common, struggle for democracy, the right to live free of sexism, the right to freely practice your religion, the right to live free of racist police murder. Look, the radical demands made in the streets help shape the party platforms agreed to in the suites, including at the Democratic National Convention. Issues like increasing the size of the Supreme Court or, or, or getting uh, rid of the Electoral College, abolishing student debt, and radical reforms of policing became topics of national discussion. All of that, bar none, was a product of mass social movements and protests. That's what we mean when we speak of the struggle for democracy. And that's what went missing after the election mass social movements. And the result was a, a crisis of inaction and gridlock in Congress. And that's what led up to the, the hesitations and reversals and compromises and giving up on key issues that, that are vital uh, to many of our very survival. So when folks are critical, of the administration as well they should be, but not forcefully addressing or taking half measures on issues like voting rights, the housing crisis, student debt, or when Biden and them call for hiring thousands of more police, which ain't gonna solve nothing by the way, we should understand why. And look, we ain't gotta make excuses for it. These democratic issues have to be solved, and they will be either by being temporarily suppressed by a Trump di dictatorship or by being acted upon by uh, a government of the People's Front brought into life and pushed to act by a re-energized mass social movement. That's what the struggle for democracy is all about. It's so vital to address these questions in a balanced and partisan way as we engage members, coworkers, and friends to vote against fascism and focus on the issues in November. Now, this is a particularly sharp question with respect to US foreign policy. You know, with the important exception of climate change, the Biden administration in the name of countering authoritarianism 
They're standing four square on a Cold War 2.0 platform. They are. Here, building a, a viable peace movement remains the main challenge. As we said at the recently concluded uh, conference hosted by the International Department, and congratulations on that, y'all, you cannot fight imperialism absent building a movement for peace. Can't do it. Can't do it. Such a movement must, you can try, but you can't do it. Such a movement must be broadly conceived, creatively organized, and doggedly pursued. For example, do we know where the environmental movement stands now with respect to China and their initial challenge of the administration's Cold War 2.0 approach on China? Because they said, no, stop, Biden, stop. Or take the issue of military budget. Are we aware of the stances of our progressive elected officials regarding next year's uh, Defense Department appropriation? Remember now, half of the Democratic caucus in the House voted against the GOP Blue Dog Bill to increase it over and above what the administration initially asked for, which was way too much already. Talk about a gift to the military industrial complex. Talk about fueling the atmosphere of war. In terms of, of, uh, of uh, building peace consist constituencies, and we thought about exchanges with trade unions, community groups, educators, and initiatives like sister cities. There are so many ways of approaching the complicated situation the peace movement finds itself in today. A national party conference on peace work, we think, would be a good way to begin to brainstorm uh, and, and, uh, and find solutions to these and other ideas. And that's part of the role of the party, to find a way when there's no way, to find an opening when all the walls and doors seem closed. And sometimes, you just got to kick those doors open. You know, Nelson Mandela once said something that resonates for me. He said, it all seems impossible until it's done. So let's find uh, a way to, to make it possible and get it done, including if we got to kick, kick down some doors. Some doors are open. Some of them you got to kick, kick in. Speaking of which, some thought that it was impossible to build this party. Well, I got some news for you. In the last year, 5,000 people have joined the party. And that's on top of the 3,000 who joined the year before. And they're paying dues, one third of them. That means that we have more than doubled our size since the last election. It's true. Don't believe me, ask Rosanna. This growth is online and offline, and it's in big cities and small towns. Party clubs are being reestablished in the Deep South, places like New Orleans, Atlanta, in the East in Providence, and in the Midwest in Peoria and Pittsburgh. And especially encouraging for me are the springing up of YCL clubs in New York, DC, Philly, Chicago, Columbus, Boston. And our clubs are active in housing struggles in Brooklyn, in Amazon organizing in Staten Island, in Starbucks organizing in Columbus, Peoria, Phoenix, in tenant battles in Detroit, where they're also fight, focusing on a state wide referendum in the fight for voting rights for immigrants in DC, Arturo, and, and on the picket lines of Minneapolis. Um, and of course, we're participating in this election fight by supporting candidates in Houston, joining labor walks in Chicago and in New York, 
the party is setting up picket lines at corporate offices that funded members of Congress that supported the coup. There were like 130 of them, maybe more fascists. And because many of these corporations have offices in cities across the country, this is something the party as a whole can participate in. My first demonstration was at an ITT office on Market Street in Youngstown, protesting the war, uh, the coup in Chile. Coming from this platform today, we want to encourage everybody to join in the effort to defeat the MAGA right in November. We know there are hesitations. You don't like the Democratic Committee? I don't like them either. However, there are many ways to participate. You can join the phone banks and GOT efforts at your local Central Labor Council, or hook up with movements like Indivisible, or join the Poor People's Campaign October voter mobilizations. Another option, if you're young, or young at heart, like yours truly, is to participate in the next gen youth and student voter turnout efforts. John says that, that if the young generations come out like they did two years ago, we, Congress is won. This is what it means when we talk about working with the forces of political independence they're independent of the Democratic National Committee. Young is, they got their own voter registration list, their own GOTV, their own money, you know, their own setup. Yeah, it's bourgeois politics. Yeah, it means working with forces on issues with which we don't agree. Yeah, it means getting your hands dirty and a bad taste in your mouth. But as we said last week at the international conference, those who fear the bad taste of things, Sorry, you're likely to fail. Let's remember January the 6th. We're fighting fascism. And if you don't defeat it now in this morning, you can be damn sure they're coming for us by noon. You want to be a vanguard party? I do. If so, the Communist Party's got to play a leading role in this fight. Not to support the Democrats, but to build a movement, to build relationships, to win the battle for democracy, fighting on the issues. Is it complicated? Is it, yeah, it is, of course it is. That's why we say put a working class stamp on it uh, by fighting for working class leadership of it. If we do that, when we run our own candidates, and I keep saying it, we must, we already have in our hands the contacts, the networks, the coalitions needed to win. And yeah, we gotta do more than vote. We gotta rally and strike and sit in and boycott. In other words, use all the tools in the toolbox and that includes the People's World and CPUSA.org. And it must include building this party in a mass public way. I want to end today by telling you a little story. You know I like storytelling. The other night, I'm scrolling on Facebook. I came across a post by a young woman in Kansas was just joined the party. And, and she was so proud and, and, and it warmed my heart. She posted a screenshot of her application so that all her friends and family and coworkers could see it. You know, and, and there was quite a discussion about it. She's not the first, but some of it was mixed, but there was a lot of positives. But what most impressed me was her public announcement, public, that's an example of the kind of party we've got to build. Public, mass, public party, as legal as we can be. We gotta fight for that, open. As Jamal says, out there, on the streets, on the campuses, 
in the workplaces, in the news, on the radio, on cable, on social media. Right now, there's nothing to stop us but us. Comrades, it's time to break out and break free. And when we do, there ain't going to be no stopping us. Long live the Communist Party. Long live the fight against fascism. Long live peace. Thank you for listening.